Well, I first want to talk a little bit of, about process again. Uh, in preparation for tonight, I um, was a professor, so I tend to do a little research before I speak, and I just went to the uh, Texana collection and saw the, uh, the master plan that the Center Point Department of Parks and Recreation had done a master plan for Breckenridge Park in 1979. And what I'm saying is that consistently as we go to neighborhood meetings, we, we are presented with plans, but the people didn't have any access to making that plan. We're tired of coming to put little dots because, because already you put a dot into an area that somebody has decided this is what you like or not, rather than saying, what do you want, and then go through the process. I reduce the certain dots because those are dots are usually consultants that come, usually in this case, perhaps not, usually from out of town who don't know the history and culture of San Antonio, tell us what the history and culture is going to be and what we need. So I think the process is all wrong with those dots because immediately those five areas are five areas that already have been predetermined rather than asking first the community and then making these things the community wants. So that's uh, in process. And the other thing is that when I looked at the 1979 plan, it was another plan that was shelved at the Texana collection, just like all the plans, maybe even this plan, because you know maybe it won't go anywhere. And so, you know, again, it, it's the process is sort of like backwards, I think. The point I want, the points I want to make are the following. San Antonio, like many uh, cities in the United States, is a minority majority city. The majority population of the city, over 60%, is Latino and Mexican American. And so that, this is a majority population. And this community has specific needs and specific aesthetics and specific ways of looking at the world. And those things should be, number one, really thought about in terms of all the plannings for the park. For example, uh, we're used to basas and patios and parques. This is a place of conviviality. This is a place where people gather. This is a place where people make a sense of who they are as a community. And so to limit access to this is to sort of tear asunder that thing that binds the people together. So it should be free access, total free access and ways that people can not have limited access. And also, uh, mobility is very important. Uh, can the proposed trams accommodate elders, the incapacity people, families? In doing the research, I read a little, uh, okay. yes, sir. In, in the, I read in the Express News, uh, this is an article by Michael Quintanilla of April 1979 after the, when they were proposing the first uh, plan for Brackenridge Park. It says more than 30,000 people join uh, into Brackenridge Park Easter Sunday. Some bring entire dining room sets from home, <laughs> barbecues, grills, mattresses, and stereo speakers to celebrate the biggest Sunday in the, in the city park. We always get together, a lot of people said. All the family, these were all kinds of, you know, all kinds of people, Anglos and Mexicans and all kinds of people saying, we always get together, all the family. It's not only a religious celebration for us, it's like forming a community. And so I think that that's very really important. So I'm saying, not limit access, uh, make sure that there's mobility, the, the trams, how are the people going to bring these stereos and the barbecue pits and the mattresses and everything else? And the dining room table, how are they going to carry this as far? The other point has already been made. Been made. When, I, when I go through almost every day, because I go to the gym on St. Mary's, and I, and I go through it, I see that the, the, the golf course, the city I think has seven golf courses already. And I read there that the golf course even though it's under the parks and recs, it's kind of different. It's positioned in a different kind of way. But I look and I see seven or eight usually elderly guys playing there when there's 40 and 50 people in the park. So I think it's really an exclusive way and that area should be come back to the park and part of the park. We talk about uh, 
sort of one of the, one of the points was uh, the cultural the layers of the culture the layers of culture in the park. Indeed, Brackenridge Park has a lot of layers of culture, particularly layers of culture for the Mexican American community. This was when I was growing up. The Urrutia estate was right there on Broadway. It was raised down. Now, now the Urrutia uh, Park, which has been privatized, which is across from uh, uh, Incarnate Word, you know, has. It's very interesting because you can go if you could go to the park. You can peer in and see, you know, pre-Columbian copies of Coyashalki. You can see, uh, you know, copies of statues of of Bacchemo. You can see almost the whole pre-Columbian history of Mexico in statues right there. But school children don't have access to it because it's closed. It's private. So that's what I mean. The the the, the there's a park here, but where they're going to build a grand entrance to the park. Well, that grand entrance should be reflective of the majority culture of the city, which is not only the majority culture, but the historic basis for this city is the Mexican city. And so that culture should be reflected in all the cultural elements of the world. Thank you. Thank you. Jacqueline Sanchez, followed by Marion Kesterman. I'm here with the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center. So. Thank you. My name is Graciela Sanchez. Um, like many people who have told stories, um, my family also attend, you know, went to and continues to go to Brackenridge Park. We were a family of six kids, two parents, and the grandparents. And so when we went to Brackenridge Park, we never went to the zoo because we couldn't afford to take six kids, two parents and two grandparents. We didn't use the train because of the same reason. We didn't rent the pavilions and we definitely never rode over the sky rides. It all cost money. What didn't cost money was using the park. And so we parked before you got into Sunken Gardens, and we walked across just like everybody else with the lawn chairs, with the ice chest, with the walking with the panchita across. We threw whatever we could up to the tree so we could collect the pecans, so mom could make her apple uh, pies, not apple pies, I'm gonna say. <laughs> Pecan pies. Um, and we watched them, you know, the playing of the polo games and always wondered about those people and, you know, stole a few golf balls that came into our area. But it was ours, it was free. And that's how we always got to participate in the culture of this city, anything that was free. And that's how you survive when your father's making $12,000 a year and he's raising the family and we survived and that's what this park has to continue to be you say right now there are no fees but we know that the city already charges fees for the pavilion you know it already costs a lot of money now add to that the parking fees that were of these parking lots we know it's going to cost we see the prices of downtown parking lots just going up and up and up we don't need parking fees added to a working class community of san antonio that is, again, the most economically segregated city in this country. Destination, you're talking about it being a destination. A destination for whom? We all know that it's there. We don't need to be told that it's there. We know that it's there. And we don't need some gated, some little sign that tells us to go there. That's just a waste of money. And I, I, I always hate when I hear that. Um, I guess one thing, well, and the great grand lawn, as everybody's talked about it, we need shade, we need more trees. That's what I've loved about it. And the types of trees, right? They're mesquite trees that go up and go sideways, and horizontal, so little kids can climb on them. This is not Central Park. We don't need to be Central Park. I love Central Park. I've gone to, you know, use it in many ways, but 
we don't need the lawn. As people have said over and over, let's put the money in restoring Second Garden Theater. We've used it, but it costs so much to use it because it just needs to be restored. So let's put the money there. I love the idea that you talk about restoring, preserving, and protecting. And what I hope you restore, pre preserve, and protect is the Mexican American and working class people that use this park. As people have said, we lost Main Plaza, and that idea was to copy the Millennial, Millennium Park in Chicago by putting all those water spouts that you're not even allowed to use anymore or walk around them or use them like they do in Chicago. We lost Travis Park most recently. We were losing Hemisphere Park with all these boutique hotels and condos that are coming up. But I think everyone here before me and during your platicas that you've had are, are saying loud and clear, we will not lose Brackenridge Park. So many have said so many important things uh, before me and eloquently out more eloquently. So I'm just going to speak to Can we have, can we have who this is, please? Oh, Mary Ann Kestenbaum? Thank you. Sure. And um, but I'll I'll say just a few points to elaborate my take on some things. Process is hugely important. Not only the kind of quirky way we got to where we are today but following up in terms of the information that will be going to city council. Well, city council are not park planners and what you'll be giving them is kind of like, this group says this, this group says that, and this group says this. And I, what I think is really important is that parks and recreation comes back to the people having synthesized this, and then we have public hearings, because this master plan, I read it and reread it, and I wasn't really sure what the end point would be, because it kind of contradicted each other. We were getting barriers, and then we were getting blurring of fee and no fee places, and uh, we were restoring the history, and then there are the weasel words of uh, uh, protecting the, what was it? Um, respect and enable culturally significant uses like Easter camping. I've been in marketing all my life. I've spun things, and I've, had, I've really worked a lot with weasel words. And, that's what it sounded like to me, instead of just saying explicitly, we will make sure that this can continue. And in fact, everybody can have picnic areas all the way, all year long. So it seemed like this was becoming an event. Um, also, um, and I have to say something about uh, the Easter picnicking. Um, I am not someone who grew up in San Antonio, but the first park I came to when I moved about 30 years ago was Breckenridge. And it, it was um, so comfortable. It was a place where people just lived lives. And I, I remember hearing on the news the first Easter I was here about the camping. I thought it was crazy and beautiful. This was my new city and it was unique and fabulous. And I think I can only say as an outsider who's grown to love my new place, that those who have lived here for their whole lives and who have lived here generations and generations and generations, this park has to reflect what the original and the most significant contributors to the city have to say. 
And the, again, this process, this is not an understandable plan. I come here as a mother. I'm not asking for anything special. I just want to, being San Antonio is a service industry city. So most of these people in the city get the minimum wage and they have the support of family of six. And all we could do is go to the park. Sometimes our AC is the only thing we have in the car and we drive through the park. And I'm just coming here to make people aware that we enjoy driving through the park. We can drive stopping when we have an extra $20 in our pocket to buy a box of chicken and a gallon of punch as a family. And that, I'm just a simple mother of four. Thank you. Thank you. So it was the uh, philosopher Plato who said, if you are not active in your own politics, you run the risk of being governed by others who are less talented. So um, that's why we're here. Um, so I think this plan has myriad flaws. It appears to be driven by developers. In fact, this plan is a developer's dream. Um, and we do know, we do know that these developers have lobbyists and they do lobby and pay city council members. Um, so that's, that's a major defect that we need to be aware of. Um, so I'll make this quick. Um, this, uh, I was, uh, this process reminds me of the hemisphere plan where it was driven by developers and uh, they, they put together this plan and it sounded really great and then all of a sudden they got in control and the plan was thrown out the window and next thing we know, we've lost Hemisphere Park and they're building hotels on our park that was supposed to be for the people forever because that was taken away from the people to build Hemisphere with the provision that it would be a public park for the people forever and now Parks and Recreation has lost control of Hemisphere and there's nothing you can do about it and I wish you could get it back but I don't think you can and so they're building their private hotels on our park so you lost Hemisphere recently you lost the Reptile Gardens it's gone and you can't get that back and then right next to it was the headwaters of the Asequia Madre. It's gone. Can't get that back. And did who did you get any money for us for that? And uh, so anyway, uh, we're kind of losing some trust, or I am losing some trust in the competency and um, and and the process. And uh, I I feel like uh, it's. it's kind of disrespectful to the people to not ask us. Uh, you know, it, it feels like we're being dismissed. You put together this plan and then ask us to put some dots on some board for a plan that's already, looks like it's already been put together by some developers. And, uh, and we are the stakeholders. <laughs> and this is our money and this is our park. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Joseph Kelly. Um, I've only been using Brackenridge Park for about the last 31 years. But, uh, but uh, you know, at, as a Comanche, um, relatives of mine and, and relatives of people in this room have been using this park for maybe about the last 15,000 years. Um, when people come to that park, celebrate Easter, the 4th of July. That isn't just about Easter, it isn't just about 4th of July, it is about 
a native history. As native religions were suppressed, instead of being able to do their traditional ceremonies and traditional holidays, instead it became Easter, it became Fourth of July. So as this plan goes forward, as we take the streets out, as we make it harder for people to go into that park and celebrate these holidays, you're pushing back on that history. Because these people who come out for Easter and camp, who come out for the 4th of July, who come out for all these different holidays, their family's been doing that for 15,000 years at least. Aside from that, when you look at this map on the back page here, all these little circles with 1A, 3B, all that, it might as well be a map of known archaeological sites in Brackenridge Park. Um, there's the uh, work for the uh, drainage ditch along the golf course. On both sides of that, about uh, one or two feet down below the surface of the soil, there are known archaeological sites that have never been able to be properly investigated, partly because it would interfere with people playing golf at the golf course. So I find it funny that there's all this discussion here about restoring and preserving the uh, cultural and historical features of the park, but nothing is made about mentioned about the first people to use this park. Beyond that, these, these are sacred places. The San Antonio River, Brackenridge Park, these are places that were continuously occupied for thousands of years. A uh, place like the Blue Hole, which you want to start to connect into all this, that's a sacred place. You know, others will go to church on Sundays to talk about God, but there are others of us who go into these parks to talk to God. And it's shocking that there is just, there's no consideration. There's nothing if you're stated about that. Other people have, have touched on these things, and it's a shared cultural history. And you can't let that go. Thank you. Hi, I'm Leslie Kelly. I'm disabled. I'm also Comanche. Don't judge the book by this cover. And in this whole plant, I see nothing at all about any sort of considerations for people with disabilities. And that's, uh, and to repeat what somebody else said earlier, if, if it works, why fix it? That's all I have to say to But I'm here representing uh, the voice, some of the voices of AARP. Um, So much has been said, and I would imagine that if you spoke to each individual volunteer and staff person from ARP that are here, uh, you'd hear agreement. Um, um, but uh, I'm also here to talk a little bit about an effort that we're involved with that it closely aligns with us. ARP has been partnering with the World Health Organization on age-friendly, livable communities. In San Antonio, two years ago, under Mayor Castro, um, to, you know, wanted to become part of this. So I've been working with ARP to develop a plan. And the plan is inclusive of many of the things that these consultants address. So let me begin with the strengths and then segue to the weaknesses. So because there is some good in what is written. Uh, but it's very clear that what, you know that there are some significant weaknesses, and if we as a community can go back to the drawing board and improve on the process and make it a participatory process, then we might have the kinds of um, outcomes uh, and results that the population really wants. So I'm going to begin with the three R's. I think we're very supportive of restoring the riverbanks and the channel and the historic buildings. That's an investment. It's building up the assets of our community, whether we're talking 
50 years or 500 years. Um, clearly, and I've heard this stated before, the second R, we want removal of the invasive plants because we want to be able to move around and not be burdened by things that could hurt us. <laughs> uh, and so, sure, that's a second R and we would support that. And the R where, where you speak of renovation, we are very supportive of uh, what you want to renovate because it's for the greater good. It's for the common good. It's for the community. And we support that. The age-friendly principles support that. We want it to be an accessible, inclusive area that many people can come to. We want to, you know, even though AARP is an advocate for the 50 plus age group, we're family advocates too. We're community advocates too. We want to be supportive of all of those things that bring us together. We are a nation. We are a community that needs to move away from divisiveness into inclusiveness, into united efforts, participatory efforts. Um, so yeah, we want the renovation of the sunken garden and other things. Um, we want improvements and we want access because by making things accessible, and that has been stated earlier, um, we're bringing more people in and we're mobilizing our community so that we get to know each other. New and different conversations emerge. New and different ideas emerge if we sit and interact with each other. There are two things that really bother us, and that's those things that start with the word close and those things that start with the word reduce. Because we don't want to reduce vehicular traffic, we want to increase all kind of traffic so that more people have access to the beauty of our community. And by closing those streets, we're doing just the opposite of what this whole project intended. And that's that to make it available, accessible, affordable for all of us in this community. And so AARP supports the idea of making Brackenridge Park a better park, but we cannot support the idea of closing streets um, and reducing the vehicular traffic. Thank you. Thank you. I just have a couple of comments. And, um, I've been gone from San Antonio for over 32 years, and I just came back six years ago. Maybe six years since November. And, and what I've seen here is that a lot of the projects that I've been involved with that I've seen happen, uh, the convention center for one really surprised the hell out of me. I mean, I thought I was going to walk into the convention center and get an infusion of the culture and the stature of San Antonio. And I, and I got greeted by this giant, what do they call it, cheese grater? And I don't know, if you can sell it to somebody for a million dollars, go ahead and sell it, because that thing doesn't add any value to the culture that's here in San Antonio. The Brackenridge Park, the Brackenridge Park has been with this city for a number of years. And I still, I've heard everybody talk, I've heard you talk, everything. I still don't know the problem that we're trying to fix. What we did, what the council did, they blessed this, they, they anointed a work plan, and we're spending money like crazy. And, and, and I got involved with the main street, street closure, and again, there was a lot of, lot of community input, don't close the street. But guess who won? Corporate America. And in this case, I think uh, uh, Ms. Verisabal, I refer to process, and then you mentioned something about a committee, and I'd like to have the names of that committee on the website so I can know who to talk to, instead of just going directly to the council people. But this project 
is like every other project that I've seen here lately, it's like the gentleman said, you're telling me to put dots on where you think I should put dots, not on the input that you got from me initially. And this process is, is going to happen whether we want it or not. It's going to happen the way you guys want it. You see this thing? Yes. I get around with it. I can go down to the park now, take this out of the car, and go down to the trail there, and set them up the leaves and goats and the bushes, and enjoy it. Now, if we do this parking garage thing, you know, 20 feet out in the weeds, I'm going to get out of the garage with 20 feet and this track. Forget it. Look. I'm 83 years old. I don't have much time left. And I don't have time to waste dealing with this obstruction. Leave the park alone. You can move the park here. Take to the drainage ditches. You can do some ecological things. But nature has been the builder of the best parks in the world. If you notice next to my name, I put a question mark. I wasn't sure whether I was going to be able to talk about it. But I want to share something with you. I came here in 1955. I was 13 years old. That was 61 years ago. And the first place, I, my mother was working at Brackenbridge Park, making $3 an hour. And I worked for free there during the summer. I remember uh, the population that we seem to be forgetting, the military, that was our best customers that we had. And I remember we had a big old watermelon box that I used to throw in watermelons and sell them, and they were our best customers on Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, that's where I learned how to speak English. And I stand there and I said, what would you like? And, and as long as they said one hamburger or hot dog or soda, I knew what they wanted. But they say, can you give me instructions on how to get to the park? I said, just a minute, please. <laughs> and I will go. Anyway, uh, what I'm getting around to is that I have very pleasant memories. Later on, I had the opportunity to work for the San Antonio Independent School District. And guess where I landed? At uh, at uh, Alamo Stadium, working there, and we used to partners and I used to jog around. So uh, I used to take the kids to the sunken gardens and get this uh, sensitivity sessions, feeling nature, and, and just walking around. The idea of, of, of the park is not not so uh, smelling it and enjoying it, and it's, it's just a beautiful place to be. So what I'm trying to say. Uh, but uh, what I wanted to say to you is that nobody has ever mentioned that where, it's, where uh, 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 Justice Pavilion, that area there, was built as a swimming pool, if you remember from back in the 30s. And the dressing rooms, were, were, I think they're still there, they were turned into gardens. And nobody's ever talked about the possibility of turning that area back into a swimming pool. And you know why? Because that means you, us Mexicans are going to be come, going over there and enjoying the hell out of it. And I'm not sure whether they want us there. You know. uh, so it's, uh, there's a lot of a lot of stuff to, that that, uh, that I can say about this place, and uh, it brings very pleasant memories. And I learned a long time ago. De lo de dicho a lo hecho hay mucho trecho. So that just means that what, we, what is said versus what is done, there's a lot, big gap in there. So somehow or another, I'm sorry, but I just don't trust the establishment to do what they say they're going to do. And even if you do what you say you're going to do, I just don't like it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Valdez. My name is Amelia Valdez and I'm actually a, a 
stuck with this, but I'm stuck peace and justice, and I'm proud to say that, because is there where I can speak my own mind as far as um, what I think is true? I actually live in the west side of San Antonio, in a modest little park, beautiful park, and I invite everybody when I do these talks to come join me on Saturday or Sunday to be a part of the community to see this beautiful park shine. Okay? Which park? Castellano Park 1728 South Santa Mora. Okay? Uh, fact, that park doesn't have a covered playground where kids burn their hands on the paper. Fact, the pavilion has not been restored since forever. Fact, there's only one bathroom for three acres of park. Fact, uh, lifeguards, not enough lifeguards for a friend, <coughs> not enough hours for that pool to be open. And fact, uh, not very friendly staff. What does that have to do with Park and Ridge Park? You got 345 acres, and we only have three acres. Okay, we need to be fixed. That doesn't need to be fixed because it's really beautiful and, and, and great. And I want to invite Ms. Babbitt to come out and enjoy or preserve or whatever we need to do on the west side of that park. Because we do need to be fixed. Earlier, before you started the talk, somebody, you said somebody got awarded money somehow. Where does that money come from? Okay, that's a question. And then, unfortunately, early this year, we had an overdose in that park. In March, we had a teen walk around with a dead fetus in their, in their purse. I've become a part of a volunteer ambassador program for that park. And they asked me, if you do this, you'll get credit to uh, use the pavilion. But I should be given credit for the long history that I have there with my family protecting that park. Thank you so much. Haley Johnson, I believe. And followed by Richard Montour, I believe. Hi, I live um, about a five minute walk away from Brackenridge Park, and I can tell you it is an absolutely lovely park, but I'm proud to be able to go there. And um, I've never seen an issue with attendance there. In fact, on Saturdays or Sundays, you're hard pressed to find a picnic table, let alone a place to sit on the grass. People go to that park. People enjoy that park. And there are Chicano, Mexican, Latino families that have been here for generations and generations that are very proud. Who are these improvements for? These are for the tech generation, white people that were trying to get into San Antonio. And I think that this is unacceptable. I work downtown and I see homeless people on the streets. We don't have a wet shelter in San Antonio. We have kids that are being shot like crazy on the east side. We don't have safe spaces for these kids to go to. We don't have proper after school services. We don't have enough places for kids to go, but we want to improve this place. And I see it as turning Broadway into this new, cool, high-tech, funky, Austin-like place we're all going to enjoy so much, but no one's going to because we're trying to attract temporary businesses into San Antonio, placate them so it'll give us a little bit of money, and we're not thinking about 20 years down the road, we're not thinking 30 years down the road. The families that have been here for generations are going to be here for generations, and we have to serve them first. It is such a blessing that we have this money. Don't take it from the pockets and put it in this park that's already functional beautiful, safe, near Central Market where you can get a lovely meal and French restaurants and all this like wonderful stuff is already there and it's happening organically. But you go into other neighborhoods and there's not even a proper bus route for people to get around. And if you spend this kind of money, this is, it's disgusting. It's sad. This is not what this city is about and we're not ready for it. And as soon as tech dries up, which you know, we're looking at what's happening in Europe right now. Like, I think we're going to hit a crisis. They are going to leave here first. We're going to have spent all this money on them rolling out the red carpet, and they're going to be gone. We saw this happen in Flint, Michigan. They kept spending money on the city, trying to get people to come, trying to get people to come. We are, we've always been Austin's bastard brother, and it's kind of nice because they're getting screwed up now. So, you know, let's enjoy our status. Let's make our community great, but let's not waste this kind of money. Like, I. I feel this sense of urgency in my gut about things that are changing in San Antonio. And it's making me really, really uneasy because I was born and raised here. 
And I don't think that anybody in this room would argue against progress. We've been promised progress for decades that never came. But I don't want that kind of progress and forget who we are at the expense of our traditions, at the expense of our identity. And I want you all to think about the kind of message that we're sending the kids, because many perspectives have been shared here today. But there's one group of people in this city that aren't here represented, and that's children. And as a father of two, I think that the most important thing that you heard today was from that mom in the back. That mom who has to drive her kids to that park with little to nothing to her name, but they don't know that. They don't know that because it's her job to make them feel like they're gonna have the best day ever. And I work in Austin. I drive there every day because I refuse to live there because they have lost culture and they've lost tradition and they've lost identity. And so I make it my, my, my point to stay here in San Antonio, having grew up right here in this neighborhood. I want you to think about the message that you're sending to our kids. As a poor kid from the Casianos or the Alasanes who Here's of this grand old park that the city is building, but when they go to ask mom and dad, can we go? Mom and dad say, we can't afford it, mijito. I don't want to send that message to our kids. If it's a message that I don't have to give my kids because I am able to pay the fees, I can go to that park if I want to. I don't care how much you charge. But there are families that grew up like I grew up that hear that message each and every day that you are less valuable that you have less access to the amenities of this of city if your parents are working for people. Thank you. Thank you. So the last person I have on my list, I just want to make sure there's anyone who didn't get the opportunity to speak, that wanted to speak, or maybe signed no and decided to change, or? Yes, ma'am? Uh, and then we'll in the back as well. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Sanabisa Romero. Actually, here representing Senator Jose Menendez's office, and just as part of the process, I, we don't have an opinion for or against. I just wanted to see who's taking notes, like if, if this is a public, publicly. Taking notes. They're taking notes in the back. And so this will be transcribed? So all these will be compiled from all the meetings and provided to the consultants, and then we'll, we'll have a compiled report that will be presented when we present to council. And so the notes will be transcribed as well? Yes. Not taped, yeah, we're, we're not, no, we're not, we need to do electronic tape. Okay, thank you. And she was first, you don't mind me, I'm sorry, and then she'll be, you can be next, yes ma'am. My name is Gloria Manas, and I originally did not sign up to say anything, but after hearing all these comments, I have a need to ask a question. You had mentioned at the beginning that uh, everything right now is in the planning stages. I believe the majority of people here do not believe that. And you also mentioned that monies have not been allocated for any of these renovations that are being proposed. My question is, who is paying the consultants? So, so as I mentioned in the beginning, the budget in 2015, I'm sorry, 2015, included money for the master plan. So that's where the consultants are paid out. The city but, is, the city is in So is it the uh, Parks and Recreation or who, what department? Well, well it it's goes to the Parks and Recreation Department, but the request came directly from the mayor's office. And one more question. How much money has already been spent on these consultants? I'm not sure how much has been spent. I know the full contract was, well, the full, not full contract, the amount of money we were allocated was $250,000. Okay, who can I call to find out how much has we been can, spent? We can get your information and we can find out where we are spent today. Actually, the gentleman uh, with the glasses, Jamal, can probably get your information if he can get you the contract information. Miss Moore, we can talk to you about afterwards, but there are... So, the sign-up sheets, if, if, if you want to put in a request, then we can provide you the sign-up sheets. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm BK Richter. Just want to let everyone know that we are recording in the back here. And I'm with Now Pass SA, and we are going to be putting that on the website, our YouTube channel, so that everyone can watch it 
and be part of the process. Thank you. Thank you. Then if there's no one else, uh, again, I ask you, invite you to uh, either you can do comment cards or you can go and speak to the staff at the different boards. If you have specific detailed questions, uh, or we have the iPads, if you can take a quick survey. So I appreciate everyone being here today. And those of you who uh, stayed for the duration, uh, we appreciate it. Thank you and have a good evening. Be safe. Uh, travels home.